Good morning, church. Any of you go to the um, back to school event yesterday? They, they have it over at Grace Lutheran every year. I think Josh ran it for a long time. But a uh, really cool community outreach. Um, yeah, if you're interested in next year, I think they always need volunteers. But um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about peace, uh, part four of our Jesus Said series. And uh, we're going over some of the things that Jesus did to prepare his disciples before he left and what he told them, what Jesus said. And we're talking about peace and um, more specifically, peace during persecution. And so um, as Americans, it's kind of easy to feel set apart from persecution. But we're told in the Bible that if you want to live a godly life, I think it says, um, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So we want to have peace, but, but peace isn't just ignoring the problem. I'm really good at that. I have to remind myself of that. Uh, my wife, Gracie, she can worry sometimes, and so she'll be telling me something like, we're moving back. We need an apartment, right? Uh, we both need to find jobs. Uh, those are things that she worries about, but I'm like, like I'll, I'll try and work on it, but I'm like, just don't think about it. Like, just don't be stressed. Like, if you're stressed about it, just, I'm really good at just ignoring problems, um, but that's not good. <laughs> we shouldn't just, it, we know persecution is coming. We shouldn't just act like it's not there and ignore it. But the other side is also wrong. We shouldn't worry and have a ton of fear and anxiety over persecution. Uh, when I was a little kid, I heard about this thing called the Great Tribulation. Have any of you heard of that? You know, yeah. It, it's kind of a, like a Christianese term. It's something that Jesus talked about, and it's talked about in the Old Testament too. And it's, it's this time that he foretells that's just full of persecution. Like it's worse than anything that came before, and it's worse than anything after. And it's kind of um, this mark for the end times that when persecution gets really bad, the Great Tribulation, that's how you know the end times are coming. At least that's one theory. There's a lot of theories about it. Um, when I was younger, that idea really scared me, especially I used to think that, you know, um, that we're going to get raptured, and like we, then the Great Tribulation will happen. But then someone told me that there's a group of people that think that the Great Tribulation is going to happen before we leave, and that scared me. I was a little kid, and in my mind, I envisioned it like, like a zombie apocalypse. Like, my family would have to go, like, forage for food, and, like, we would have to, like, bring the shotguns and, like, protect ourselves from the government that's trying to attack us. Like, scary stuff for a little kid. Um, and I had a lot of fear about it. I would even pray. I would pray, like, God, you know, please don't let that be while I'm alive. Like, just wait until after I'm gone, or... Just at least let me go quick in the beginning, and then I'll be with you. That was my thought. It terrified me. That's not good. Um, and there's actually a theory about the, the Great Tribulation that Jesus talked about, that he was actually talking about what was about to happen after he died a couple of, uh, for the next couple hundred years, the Roman Empire, and how they oppressed Christians, how they threw them in cages to be eaten alive, and burn them at the stake, horrible, horrible stuff that we know happened, that God foretold. Some people think it's then, and so I, I kind of hope that's it, because if that's not it, and it's going to be worse than that, <laughs> I'm really scared. Um, but yeah, I, it's really easy for us Americans to, to not think of this as an issue, but if you look back through history, you can see how easily it, it became an issue, how fast it came on. I want to read you guys uh, a part of a book called The Gulag Archipelago. It's a, a really hard book to read, um, but it, it's a story, it's a collection of stories from prisoners in the Soviet Union, and it talks about everything that happened in the, the prison camps and the, the torture and the the, uh, the horrible things that happened to Christians in the Soviet Union. Not just Christians in general, um, but it says this. The root destruction of religion in the country, which throughout the 20s and 30s was one of the most important goals of the GPU, could be realized only 
by mass arrest of Orthodox believers, monks and nuns whose black habits had been a distinctive feature of old Russia life, where intensively, they were intensively round up on every hand, placed under arrest and sent into exile. They arrested and sentenced active laymen, but the circles kept getting bigger and bigger as they ranked in ordinary believers as well. Old people, and particularly women, who were the most stubborn believers of all, and who for many years to come would be called nuns in transit prisons and in camps. True, they were supposedly being arrested and tried not for their actual faith, but for openly declaring their convictions and for bringing up their children in the same spirit. As Tanya Kutkovich wrote, you can pray freely, but just so God alone can hear. She received a 10-year sentence for those words. A person convinced that they possessed spiritual truth required, was required to conceal it from their own children. In the 20s, the religious education of children was classified as a political crime under Article 5810 of the Code. In other words, counter-revolutionary propaganda. Now, if you don't know this, before the Soviet Union, the country of Russia was a deeply Christian country. The uh, a split off of the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church up there, was really big. It's still really big. But it was a big part of their culture. No one thought that like religion, we were going to be persecuted. It was normal, everyday life in Russia. And, and what it says in this book is that it was kind of like a fake tolerance. Like, we're okay with religion, as long as you don't act upon it at all. And that's kind of what we get told today, right? Like, people will respect your beliefs as long as you don't share them, right? Like, and definitely don't raise your kids. I've even heard it said that um, raising your kids in your religion is children abuse, like child abuse. Like, how backwards is that? And even though it seems like in America we're so far removed from this, just like in Russia, we're, we don't know how fast this could happen. That's a scary thought. Um, I was talking with uh, Pastor John this week, and I was telling him about our church and um, our Bible college back in Boise and talking about how this awesome thing happened where they're leasing some of their land and then they'll get the land back in 50 years along with all the property that was built on it. And I was saying like, yeah, this is a really cool thing. It's kind of like um, a trust for the college to ensure that they'll still be there. And Pastor John said something that I really didn't expect. He said, yeah, if Christianity is still allowed then in 50 years, I never thought about that. It's, it's really easy to be complacent and not realize how close horrible things are. And it's not like it's just something that might happen to you. Going back to that verse, if you live a godly life and follow Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. It's not something that might happen. It's a fact. I'm not saying all this to scare you guys or to follow culture and like victimize ourselves. I'm, I'm saying this because it's not good to ignore problems. It's not good to act like it's not going to happen, but it's also not good to, to be scared and anxious about it. So I'm going to kind of try and walk that line today, going into what Jesus said. Uh, our verse today is John, 20, John 14, 27. That's, that's where we're finding what Jesus said. Man, like the front rows are empty. John and Josh must, must just like spit as they talk really bad. You guys are afraid of the blast zone. Splash zone. <laughs> as John... 1427 it says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So some of the context behind this, or actually let's start, let's start off by defining peace. And in the Bible, peace is used in a lot of different ways. There's uh, like the Old Testament shalom idea of peace as you're in God's presence and everything is as it should be. But it's also used like not fighting between members of a congregation. I think here, in this context, peace could be defined as 
the absence of inner turmoil, even in great outer turmoil. Even when bad things are going along, wrong all around you, even when you're being attacked on all sides, you don't have turmoil inside of you. And that's what Jesus promises here. I leave it with you. I give to you my peace. In the context that Jesus is talking in, he's talking to his disciples. We've been going through this the last few chapters of John. And the context is that Jesus is about to die. He's about to leave them. And he's preparing his disciples for that. Um, a few chapters away, in chapter 16, he says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. And so Jesus knew this persecution was coming. He didn't ignore it. He, he tried to, to get them ready for it. And, and it seems how he did that was one among many things was giving them peace. I think you could say that peace is the antidote to persecution. It's how we get through it. And, and it's amazing because he promised the peace to his disciples, but he also promises it to us. And we're, we're in that line of followers of Jesus that have passed down, and the promises that he's making to them also apply to us. And uh, first, before we talk about how we can experience this peace, it's really important to understand that God is the source of peace. He himself is peace. And that's an amazing thing, right? Because guess what? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've been baptized and repented of your sins, you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. That's amazing. We have the source of all true peace within us. No Christian should ever go without peace because we have it at not even a fingertip away. But raise your hand if you've ever felt not at peace, right? It's everyone. Everyone has it. So why does this happen if we have the source of all peace right inside of us? Well, John 14, the, the verse that we started off with, tells us that God promises peace. Jesus says, my peace, I will leave you. But he doesn't say that it's not going to be a journey. He doesn't say that you're just, no matter how you live, no matter what you do, you're going to have my peace. It's not just a, a switch that, you know, I'm gone, here's peace. It's, it's a gift, but he also commands us. He also says, do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. That isn't something he's giving us. That's something he's telling us to do. So peace is a gift, but it's also a command that we have. So it takes effort on our part. We have to, to accept the gift. We have to, to work to have it and to keep it in our life, right? It's a gift, but it takes effort. And I think one of the ways that we can accept this gift that God is giving us is by drawing close to him, spending time in devotion with God, meditating on his word and on his truth, and letting that have an effect on our life. Uh, God being the source of, source of peace kind of reminds me of like a river. If you go up to a river, you look at the, the source, maybe it's coming out of a lake, you can have a giant, raging, dangerous river that just floods. You go 20, 30, 40 miles down that river, you might just have a creek. If God is your source, and you're not drawing close to him, you're not letting his presence affect your life, then you're only going to have a creek. I want that raging river of peace over my life. So, I think um, talked about one way you can experience peace is by meditating on God's word and on his truths. I think that two, two passages of scripture, especially in persecution, will help us to have peace. The, the first one, we have peace because Jesus already overcame the world. That we're not fighting a battle that hasn't been won. The battle that we fight today, Jesus fought 
thousands of years ago, and he won it. He's already finished the race, as it talks about in Hebrews 12. You know, we're running this race, but as we run it, we know that it's not up to us, but that there's Jesus that's already crossed the finish line, and that we can live in the success that he had. And so take time to meditate on that. Think about how the struggles you're going through aren't unique to you. The struggles that you're going through, Jesus also experienced. And I think another thing that we can meditate on that'll help us is that, yeah, Jesus overcame the world already, but in the end, God will ultimately overcome the entire world. That it's not, the world's not going to win. In 1 Peter 5, 10, it says, In God's grace, and, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Whatever suffering you're going through today, whatever, whenever you see persecution on the horizon, whenever you think about that, know that that pain, that death, that fear, that doesn't last. It, that's not going to last forever, but God will. At the end of the day, God's going to bring everything under his control. And if you're a child of God, that's going to be an awesome day. So even though it seems like, like what we're facing in the world might be so big, it's tiny compared to what God can do. So meditate on those two things. Think about, you know, whatever I'm facing, Jesus has already overcome that for me. And whatever I'm going to face, it's going to end. And Jesus is going to overcome everything. So since how much peace that we experience is directly related to how close we are to God, I think there's a couple of ways that we choose to not be close to God. We choose to not experience peace, even though we think we might be asking for it, we might be begging and praying for peace, but, but secretly we don't want it. I think there's a couple of ways that that happens. One, we don't experience peace when we take things into our own hands. When I'm over here and I'm not going to let go of this, even though it's not what's right for me. I'm going to hold on to it because I think that I can deal with everything that's going on on my own. I can put everything on my shoulders and make it through this. I don't need to rely on anyone else, right? We can tell ourselves that. And when we do that, it might just seem like we're, we're like trying to be strong, but we're rejecting the peace that God wants to give us. When we reject God's peace because we think we can handle everything our own way, we don't experience peace. Another way is we don't experience peace when we decide to live in sin. Sin separates us from God. That's kind of a theologically, a theological idea, as in uh, sin can't be in the presence of God because God is so holy. But also, just psychologically, when we live in continual unrepented sin, it's hard to come to God. It's hard to say, like, because in order to come to God, you know you're being a hypocrite unless you repent, and repenting isn't easy. So when we, when we choose to hold on to sin, we separate ourselves from God. We stop ourselves from being in God's presence because of the shame and guilt we feel. And then we don't have peace. I think the third way we can not experience peace that we can choose to is just we don't experience peace because we don't want to. Sometimes you'd rather be mad. Sometimes you'd rather want to get revenge. You'd be angry. Sometimes it kind of feels nice to be sad. Like we think we sit in our sadness and we don't want to let go of it because that's, that's how we feel and that's, we think we, what we feel is right and we want to sit there and hold on to that instead of giving it up to God. Okay, so we've talked about how we can choose to accept God's peace by being close to him and meditating on his word. But what's the purpose of peace in our life? If Jesus commanded, he said, so that you don't fall away. That's one reason. I don't think it's just so that we feel good inside, right? God's not giving us peace just so that we don't suffer. I think that it's so that we don't fall away. And also, 
I think we need peace because peace prepares us to properly respond to being persecuted. That when we don't have peace, we fight back like the world does. When we get attacked, we think that we need to defend ourselves and fight back. And that's not how the kingdom of God works. That's not how you're supposed to respond. But let's talk about a story where people responded the right way because they had peace. So in Acts 5, verse 41, um, what has just happened is that Jesus left a little bit ago. He ascended into heaven. And Peter and John have been preaching in the temple. They even healed a paralyzed man. But uh, the Sanhedrin, which was like the rush, the Israelite authority in the land, like they, they had the authority right underneath Rome because Rome had the true authority. But they, this council, they sent out guards to arrest Peter and John, and they brought them before them, and they said, hey, stop talking about Jesus. And they were going to kill them. They were really close to putting them to death. But this one guy stands up, and he says, you know, if what they're doing is from God, then they'll, they'll succeed. So we shouldn't stand in their way. But what if, if it's not from God, then they'll fail. So we don't really have to worry about it. We've seen other people come up before, and when their leader dies, they all fall away. So they decide to let him go, but before they let them go, they beat them. I think we still got to show them that we have the authority not to mess with us, so they beat them harshly. And so Peter and John have just been beat, and they're walking away, and this is how they respond. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They were happy that they got the chance to be beat for his name. Jesus talked about it. Blessed are those who withstand all kinds of persecution and evil in my name. And and after they'd been beat, they praised God, and they didn't fight back. It says what they did next is, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They had the opportunity to let the fear and the anxiety of being beaten and that happening again and maybe even being killed next. They didn't let that fear and anxiety stop them from doing what is most important. Proclaiming the gospel and the good news of Jesus. That's what peace allowed them to do. When they were at peace, knowing that God's going to take care of all of it, I don't have to fight back. I don't have to get my revenge. I'm just going to go on doing what God wants me to do. Next story I want to mention is the story of Stephen. If you don't know who Stephen was, he was one of the godly men that was appointed as a deacon to take care of the widows in Jerusalem. And so he was one of those guys who was just the hands and feet of God. He was there doing ministry, feeding people, bringing them food, taking care of them. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees in Jerusalem didn't like that. They grabbed Stephen and they arrested him. They brought him in with their guards and they held like a mock trial that was really pretty fake. And what they did is they got all these people and paid them to bear false testimony. All of the charges that they brought against Stephen were fake. He could have just argued and said, no, I didn't do any of that. And they didn't have any evidence on him except for the people that were lying. That's all they had. So if I was in that situation, I would argue like heck. Like I would, I would fight. Be like, no, I never did that. But what Stephen does is, does is amazing. He doesn't, when he's put to make a choice between caring about himself and caring about the gospel, the peace of God allows him to do what's most important. And what he does instead of defending himself is he does, it's like two chapters of his sermon. He goes through the entire history of the Israelites. He's preaching to these people who live to study the history. And what he does is he goes through their entire history and shows how everything that's happened to them, everything that all these people know and have memorized, it all points to Jesus. The peace of God allowed him to not worry about himself, what was going to happen to him. But again, focus on the most important thing that he could do, which was preach the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. So don't let your heart be troubled. 
Don't be afraid. That's a command from Jesus Christ. When you see persecution and you have fear and anxiety about it, come close to the God who has already overcome the world and will in the end overcome everything. Draw close to him. Let him affect your life and let the peace that he gives you transform how you choose to respond to persecution. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to be here, that we aren't persecuted right now, that we're not banned from joining to worship you. I pray that that thought will just bring gratefulness to our hearts. To let church not be a thing that we feel obliged to do, but for church to be a thing that we are so grateful that we get to come here and make this day all about you. Thank you for the peace you give us, and thank you for your mighty hand that guides us throughout our life. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.